Hi everybody. Today we're going to do lesson four and it's on one of my least favorite subjects. In fact, the next two lessons are actually a little complicated, but lesson four I titled A Life Submitted to God. And I've never met anyone who submission came naturally to. So I think as we look at this, keep that in mind. I actually look forward to teaching this passage because I think it's one of the passages that can get altered and confused and I think misinterpreted quite a bit of the time. So I want us to look carefully at Peter's words and receive them in a first century context so that we can translate them accurately to our 21st century context. So Peter was writing to a group of people, many of whom had been forced to flee from Jerusalem under persecution, and most of them who when they became Christians, they had to step away from their families sometimes, certainly away from home and all of the things that they had held dear their whole life. And they were relocated to these cities uh, in Asia Minor, which remember is modern day Turkey. So it was a very different culture. When they landed there, they did not feel like they were like anyone that they were living around. I remember when I was uh, my second year of college, my family moved from Southern California to Houston. And I've often said that California to Houston, Texas wasn't changing states. It was literally changing countries as far as I was culturally used to. So I understand some of these verses that we're going to look at today. I remember what it was like to sound different, to feel different. Now I'm thoroughly a Texan. I've been here 43 years in Texas, so I am definitely a Texan now, but I still have my California roots. Um, anyway, I understand what it's like to live when you feel different than the people around you. Not only that, I'd never been Baptist before. That's a whole other story. We'll save it for another time. And so this is the passage we looked at. He's just finished. Peter's just written that he wants them to abstain from sinful desires because they wage war against their souls. Our sins wage war. The stuff that our human nature wants can wage war against what God wants for us. And he says, live such good lives among the pagans. Wherever you are, live such a great life that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds. And because of that, they will glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, because they've witnessed your life, they have a chance to live eternally uh, in heaven. So the word submit, in scripture is almost always used as a voluntary choice. That's before we go any further in this passage, it's something you need to understand. Peter is saying, to, when he says to submit, he's saying you need to make a choice to put someone else ahead of yourself. It's a choice to respect or allow another person a position of authority in your life that you will honor. Submission is almost always about the choice to go against what feels natural. None of us are made to naturally submit. Well, maybe some are, not many are made to naturally submit. It, and yet it can often in our lives be the choice that most gives us the opportunity to glorify God's leadership in our life, his presence. So. Peter had firsthand experience with the idea of submitting to something that, an idea that he did not like in Acts chapter 10, when the sheet lowered and those animals were there and God said, take and eat. And he said, surely not, Lord. Surely you don't want me to eat that. And God said, no, I want you to eat anything that I call pure, don't call impure. That was the introduction of 
the first Gentile conversion to faith. One of the most difficult problems that faced the early church was this idea that God's people could be Gentile, come from a Gentile background. By this time, this church is actually more Gentile than Jewish. And so conflicts arose. Uh, Paul talks a lot about the specific ones in his letters. It was tough for somebody who had been raised Jewish to, as I like to say, sit in the pew next to somebody who maybe wasn't. And what was natural for them and acceptable to them wasn't even close to acceptable to another. And Peter's saying, there are times in our life where we submit to a person or a place and we choose to respect a person's position in our life, even if we don't respect the person himself. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. So Peter knew what it was. So Peter had firsthand experience in Acts chapter 10, when he had to consume food that for his entire life had felt wrong to eat. That is what we look at today. It sometimes feels wrong to do some of the things that God's going to ask us to do or, or to submit to some people in our lives. It will sometimes feel like that's a wrong choice. But let's look at Peter's principles for that. He was teaching this early church how to live as missionaries in a land that was pagan, that knew nothing but pagan ideas and practices. So for these exiles in the land, people who were Christian and were viewed as being very different, that's how we need to read Peter's words today. The longer we stay in the American culture on its current trends, we as Christians, especially Christians who adhere closely to what the Word of God teaches, we will likely begin to feel more and more like foreigners in our own country, exiles in our own land. Well, Peter wanted them to understand that it's not our job to belong in the world, be popular with the world, or even feel comfortable in the world. What's, pop, what's important is that we adhere to the higher standards that he's given us. In other words, be a missionary, even if you're home. So he begins, or it, this today's passage, it's chapter two of First Peter, beginning with verse 13. He uses that word. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. We have to stop there and own that. The first thing, submit yourself. This is a voluntary choice. This is the choice to put someone else ahead. Submit yourselves, why? For the Lord's sake, for the sake of your witness with this person, for the sake of God's word. Submit yourself to somebody because the greater good is their eternal life and yours. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake so that you can accomplish what the Lord wants you to do in their life. To who? To every human authority. That's what Peter writes. We submit to human authorities for the Lord's sake because our witness is more important than our earthly life. He says, whether it's to the emperor, as to the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. These early Christians were told by Peter to submit themselves to some really ungodly leaders. And that was hard for them to hear. It would be hard for us to hear now. 
Every once in a while, I would send my kids off to school, and one of them would have a teacher that I might kind of cringe at. And I taught my boys that even if you can't always respect the person, you do need to respect their position as teacher. And that gave them permission to believe what they believed and still respect that person as their teacher. That's what Peter was saying to these early Christians. You know what you believe. You know what matters. You know what matters eternally. Submit yourselves in your lives to these authorities and honor the position that they've been given in the culture. That is an especially important message because I'm talking to people right now whose candidate may win or have won or may not. Either way, we owe our president our respect. We owe our president honor for the position that he's assumed. That's the point of what Peter's making. We don't slander someone in office. We've been told not to do that. We should try not to do that. And it is hard. Why? Because for the Lord's sake, we shouldn't ever say anything that might limit or keep us from be able, being able to share the gospel with anybody. So, why should submission to ungodly leaders be part of God's higher plan or purpose? 1 Peter 2.15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. In this verse, ignorant, foolish people is another word Actually, in the original language, it would be better translated obstinate sinner. In other words, Peter's saying, by honoring them even when they are dishonorable, you can silence the talk of foolish people who might come behind an obstinate sinner. My mom would have put it to me this way. She would have said, you don't need to climb down in the gutter if that's where the fight's going on. That's what she used to tell us. That's what Peter is in essence saying here. Keep your high place, walk the high road, but don't dishonor the people who choose to take another one. So we have authorities in our lives, some of which we can respect, some of, some of whom we can't. And so Peter's saying, in every situation, put your witness first. It's for God's sake that we submit ourselves. We make the choice to humble ourselves so that we can lift Jesus up. How does Peter describe a life that is freely submitted to God? Submitting to God is very much that choice. There are things in scripture that we need to give God authority for that we might not want to. I would rather believe some of what the culture wants to believe. I would rather uh, say that I believe that too because it sounds nicer. I've often said that Christians need to lead the kindest lives, the most loving lives, because truthfully, sometimes our message isn't kind and doesn't feel loving to someone. There are times when we have to tell a person, I'm sorry, but I can't believe that. I'm sorry, but I don't want that for your life. Especially in these times today, I feel like our church is bending a little and erring on the side of kindness, even if it steps away from truth. So, Peter tells us to live a life that is submitted to God. And if it brings slander into our life, as long as we're lined up with God's word, that living stone that who is Jesus, we're okay. 
Peter said to the early church, he said, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover up for evil. I remember as a young teenage Christian, I used to think, well, the preacher told me I'm saved no matter what, that I'm going to heaven no matter what. So I'll just go do what I wanna do and then I'll ask God to forgive me and he has to because the Bible says so. That would be a teenage immature faith, right? And we've all been there. So how does Peter describe a life that's really submitted to God? That we live as free people, but we don't use this freedom we have. We don't use this assurance of our salvation, this knowledge that all we have to do is ask God to forgive. We don't use that freedom as a cover up to do what we wanna do or believe what we wanna believe or accept what God has called unacceptable. So the next line is important. Peter then said, you're to live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor who was not godly. He says to them, you need to show proper respect to everyone. Why? Because God has told you to. And it isn't your choice. We don't get an option. We are to treat people with respect and honor, even when they're unrespectable. One of the hardest things God has asked us to do. We don't like the term slaves, and especially for those of us in the American culture, there's a certain connotation to that word. We have a definition of that word. I need to define that word like it meant in the first century. A slave in the first century was almost always what we would call an indentured servant or somebody who'd signed a contract to fulfill a certain job by a certain time, contract labor. When we accepted Jesus as our savior, we also gave him permission to be our Lord. Everybody wants a savior. It's that whole Jesus as Lord that messes us up. This is what Peter's talking about. He said, in essence, when you made Jesus your savior, when you made him your Lord, you gave him permission to rule your life. You asked him in essence to make you a slave, an indentured contract, an indentured contract labor. There were slaves in this era, absolutely human beings who were treated as property that is and always has been a reality. This world will never be without slaves because human beings always mistreat other human beings. God is saying to voluntarily choose to allow God to enslave you to his will. Why? Because it's the best life you'll ever have. How do you do it? You show respect to everyone. You love who? The family of believers. Love fellow Christians. That's something every Christian needs to hear now. We always argue mostly with one another. My husband has a phrase he likes to use. He says, Christians are the only people who bury their wounded. We do that in our churches. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody deserves respect, even if we can't agree with them. Because arguing with them, debating them, and I've done it. I'm maybe among the worst. I have sinned in this area. The bottom line is they deserve my respect for God's glory. That's God's child. He loves them.
I should too. So, show respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Never lose sight of who God is. Live in fear of Him. Live in reverent awe of who God is as your Father. And even honor the emperor if necessary. God intended these words to be studied, not just read. The next passage is a really good example of that rule. We have to study these next words to know what they mean. He then addressed the members of his church that he was writing to, or all of the churches. He said, slaves. He addressed those early Christians as slaves, people who have given God the final authority in their life. He said, in reverent fear of God, because you love him and know he is God, submit yourselves, choose to submit yourselves to your masters. These people in your life that are your bosses, that are your authority figures, who can ask you to do things that you would maybe rather not do, never sinful things, but just things that you wish you didn't have to do. But they're, you've given them a position. You've promised yourself an authority, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it's commendable if somebody bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Let me summarize this verse. Every time you treat somebody with respect when they didn't deserve it, every time you choose to love when what they deserve is something else, every time you choose to, choose to treat a person like God wants you to treat them instead of how your gut wants you to treat them, You've stepped out of what is human and into what is commendable. Not only that, you've stepped into what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life, through your life, instead of what you naturally want to do yourself. In that moment, know that God commends that attitude, that work. That's a commendable life that can be spirit-owned like that that can be spirit-controlled like that, especially when it's unjust suffering. So we look at a tough passage. Why does God allow people to suffer, even unfairly suffer at times? He says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Picture Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin while accusations are hurled at him and he remains silent. Those are the next verses. We have an example of how we're to act during those difficult times when we're asked to honor or, or put up with things that we don't want to. He says, Peter says, to this you were called. Not a suggestion. God's called us to that life because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to our own sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep and we've all gone astray. But now you've returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. It's easy to live in this world like a sheep. And sheep are notoriously uh, known for following whatever sheep walks in front of them. We were 
in our human natures made to be followers and not always following what is right. And so God gave us this divine example the, God gave us himself in Jesus, God incarnate, God with flesh on him. As a living human walking on this earth example that anyone who God is controlling can step away and live the life God's called us to live. Stepping away from the influences of this world, it's not easy. In fact, it's impossible. There's no way we can do it apart from the strength God's Holy Spirit gives us. And so Peter quoted that verse from Isaiah 53 known as the suffering servant passage. It's who Jesus was prophesied he would be. It's who he was when he came. It's the life he lived. And now Peter says, that's our example. Jesus even said, they persecuted me. They will persecute you too. Don't be surprised when it happens. But in that moment, say, God, there's no way I know how to do this myself. There's no way I own this forgiveness. There's no way I can respect that person. There's no way I can honor he, him or her. There's no way. And you're in the right spot. Because he says, I know. That's why I gave you my spirit. So you'd have the strength to do it. That's what Peter's teaching the church. He knows he's asking the impossible. But it's like Mary said when she found out she was going to carry the Son of God. She said, I know nothing is impossible with God. We can be that person that God calls us to be, that Peter's asking us to be, urging us to be. So chapter three begins with another really difficult passage. It says, wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see purity and reverence, the purity and reverence of your lives. This is a first century verse. It's also a 21st century verse. What Peter just said in the same way, Jesus submitted his own abilities, his own self before the Sanhedrin and allowed them to have authority over his life. In the same way, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Love God so much that whatever you do with your spouse is honoring of God. In this church in this time, there were a lot of women that had come into the early church who had been married and they became Christians and their husbands didn't appreciate that. Peter says, their eternal life matters most. Submit yourselves to them. Women didn't have a place in this society. They didn't have the choice to divorce or get another job. It wasn't the choice God wanted for them. He said, honor your husband in this way. Put your husband's eternal life ahead of this one. Honor your husband because it might be your life that gives him eternal life. Live pure, live reverent, live that as an example. I have for many, many, many years taught women, some of whom, many of whom are married to men who are not Christians. And I always tell them that it's not their words, it's not the debate, it's not the argument that's gonna lead your husband to faith. It's this joy in your life, it's who you are, it's that you love them even when they're unlovable. 
at times, and aren't we all? That's what Peter's saying. Even with a spouse, put his eternal life ahead of his earthly one. So remember, our lives are our most important witness. He says, which he says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment. He said, such as elaborate hairstyles, the wearing of gold jewelry, or it looks gold jewelry, or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Blunt, this passage ought to put some plastic surgeons out of business. We're spending way too much money trying to look different than we really are. It's not necessary. Your beauty, according to Peter, is your soul. It's who you are. It's the genuineness of your faith. It's your inner self. And I will tell you, we know that as women, that too often we've used outward appearance as a power source over men. That's in essence what Peter's suggesting as well. Don't use outward appearance to try to be convincing or uh, get your way. So instead, let your beauty be that of who you really are, this character that you are, this character that you own, that God has produced and made in you. It's your inner self. Why? Because the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit is of great worth in God's sight. If you're going to be attractive and work at being attractive, work at being attractive to God, and you'll be good. For this is the way the holy women of the past put their hope in God. In, and used, they used to adorn themselves, but instead, what did they do? They submitted themselves to their husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. And I gotta tell you, Abraham sold his wife out twice in the Old Testament. Abraham was not a husband that was honorable twice, but Sarah honored her husband anyway. And from that relationship, God birthed the family of God. So Abraham and Sarah had a son, they named him Isaac. Even though she, Abraham had sold her out twice, she stayed faithful to him and a generation, Abraham was enabled to become the father of God's people. So is there reward in submitting your life in, to God and to your husband? Yes, there is. But this is what you need to know. If you do what's, if you are her daughters, if you are Sarah's daughters, you do what's right and you don't give away to fear. That's what this passage is teaching. If we're truly using Sarah as an example, we don't give up. We keep going because what God has for us out there is our best. Now, I pause here to say a word of caution. I do not believe you're supposed to stay in a house with a man that is physically or emotionally abusing you. I do think you can separate and respect what you can respect, but you are not supposed to be hurt. That is not submitting yourself. That is allowing yourself to be abused. But to put someone's eternal life to put God's plan for both of your lives ahead of your own is what it means to submit to God's perfect plan. And that's what Peter is saying. Be willing to choose to put someone else first. How do men submit to God and treat their wives? Husbands, the next words are everything. Husbands, in the same way. We're all being called, men, women, husbands, wives, we're all being called to submit to God in the same way, the same way Jesus submitted to God.
and we treat our spouse accordingly. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate. Put that other person first as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner, physically weaker, less esteemed in society. They had no ability to live apart from a man. They went from their father's household to their husband's. That was this culture. And he said, be considerate to them because they don't have the opportunities you have in the first century. They're the weaker sex. They're heirs with you. That's the point of this passage. He said to the men, understand, your wives are heirs with you. They have an inheritance in heaven too. They have a walk with the Lord too. They have a position as a child of God too. They are heirs with you of the gracious gift of eternal life. So nothing, don't mistreat your wife because you don't want anything, verse seven, to hinder your prayers. So we read this and focus on the word submit most of the time. And it's not where our focus should be unless we are focusing on submitting to God. In this passage, that's what Peter has said. Husbands, wives, you have different roles. You have different lives, but you're to treat each other, submit to each other so that God is glorified. So that as an example to other people, people can see God at work in your life. You choose God first. Submit to God. Submit to authorities as missionaries whose number one job is to bring others to faith in Christ. We're missionaries in this world. If you're a Christian, you are a missionary. You don't live, well, let me put it this way, you're not home yet. You're a missionary in this world. It's not bad to see yourself or feel like that's the way you're having to live. Submit to God and submit to your marriage partner, choosing to make their needs more important than your own. Do you know how many marriages would be saved if through God's strength we did that? The desired result of submission is that other people are honored and respected, that we choose what's best for them eternally instead of choosing what's best for ourselves now. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And let me say again, what I've been teaching here today isn't easy. In fact, let me conclude with this. This life that Peter has called us to today isn't possible apart from the Lordship of Christ in our life. It isn't possible without his strength and his power. It isn't possible unless we know God and adore him like we should. Who in your life do you need to think about this? Command. Who's God telling you to honor today? that you didn't want to honor before? That's not a suggested question. That's one to come up with an answer to. And then when you turn your computer off or your screen or I'm no longer in front of you, don't move until you've talked to God about that. You can't forgive them apart from God's forgiveness that he places in you. You can't honor them in your human strength. You can when God gives you the ability to do that. Ask him for his sake. See you next week.